What if this dream that I can see could change how things are to how they could be? Two letters, that's all. If takes a chance and risks a fall. Others say why. If answers why not. Dare to take action. If starts with a thought. One little if in one little me. To fight the current, to swim upstream. If doesn't ask when. If says now. From here to there. If is the how. If starts sooner, stays longer, keeps the faith. Gets back up, goes back to work, sets the pace. So now I'll start, I'll begin. Without the start, there'd be no win. If counts the cost, a price to pay. Sees the potential, then seizes the day. If today, then tomorrow. Show something for the breath you borrow. Take a leap, just a step, growing old without regret. Tell me now, what's your what if? What will it take to scale the cliff? You have the vision, make it come true. Sometimes that what if is you. In the end, it goes to show there's no telling what one if can grow. Finish what you start, and then the time has come to dream again. Who knows what a day will bring? What if this changes everything? So George Whitfield was an English preacher and one of the key founders of, the, of Methodism and the Evangelical Movement back in the 18th century. Before the 13 colonies actually formed to become a country, it's estimated that nearly 80% of all Americans at the time heard Whitfield preach in person. It all began because of, of an as-if statement. It was back in 1740 that Whitfield traveled across America uh, where he preached a series of revivals that became known as the First Great Awakening. Whitfield would capture large audiences by, by a potent combination of, of drama, religious rhetoric, and, and really imperial pride. His methods were far from traditional and often found himself in scuffles with other preachers and theologians. Whitfield spoke to crowds numbering in the tens of thousands, all without amplification. Ear witnesses claim that you could hear his voice for a country mile. And so here am I in this tiny little room with a microphone strapped to my face. He didn't preach in a church from behind a pulpit. He preached in fairgrounds and fields to anyone who would listen. And, and entire communities would actually shut down. Businesses would close so that they could hear Whitfield preach, whether it was at the crack of dawn or at the stroke of midnight. It's said that he has preached over 18,000 sermons over his 34-year career, touching the ears of over 10 million people. Let's break that down a little bit. That's 500 sermons a year. Or if you prefer, 1.369863 sermons per day. Now, if you preach that many sermons, you get all the decimal credit you can get. Now let's put that in a little bit more perspective. I currently preach one sermon a week, sometimes maybe two if I preach at a school chapel or a special service. I also get a couple weekends off a, a year. So let's say I preach 50 sermons a year. Well, I still have 450 to go to even get close to what Whitfield was able to do. You might be asking, well, well what drew these crowds to Whitfield? What, what was it that attracted them? Well, one thing is certain, it wasn't Whitfield's good looks. And I'm not trying to, to dog the guy, but if you look at surviving portraits of Whitfield today, he was cross-eyed, which made speaking to him a little bit of an awkward experience. But if ever there was a double meaning, it was just that, that no one kept their eyes focused on Jesus more than George Whitfield. 
Some historians considered Whitfield to be the first celebrity pastor in America. And, and whether one agreed with his messages or not, everyone was attracted to him. Even Benjamin Franklin, who didn't agree with his doctrines at all, became his publicist and printer. And, and even Franklin admitted that, that he emptied his pockets at one of Whitfield's offerings. So how was this cross-eyed colonial able to uh, attract the consideration of such large crowds? What, what drove him? I would suggest that that he preached as if everything he said was true. He said it like he believed it. When, when most preachers were reading these dry moral essays, uh, uh, Whitfield was preaching like a, a person possessed, like a, a cage fighter with nothing else to lose. His intense, passionate, uh, booming voice gave him the nickname Thunder and Lightning. And it all originated from a story he told in one of his sermons dubbed as his as-if moment. So the year was 1675. The Archbishop of Canterbury had acquainted with an actor named Mr. Butterton. One day the Archbishop said to Mr. Butterton, Tell me, Mr. Butterton, what, what is the reason that you actors on stage can affect your congregations with the speaking of things imaginary as if they were real? While we in the church speak of things real, though our congregations only receive as if they were imaginary. Why, my Lord, said Mr. Butterton, the reason is very plain. We actors on stage speak of things imaginary as if they are real. And you in the pulpit speak of things real as if they are imaginary. That as if statement hit Whitfield right between his crossed eyes. And he declared from that point forward, therefore, I will not be a velvet mouth preacher. Now, did you catch it? Therefore. Therefore. One little word. Therefore is where as if begins. So we're in our third week of this teaching series that we've entitled If. This puny two-letter word packed with so much potential power. It's really the pivot point of, of moving from a life of fear to a life of faith as we trade in our if-only regrets for God's what-if possibilities. There are 1,784 ifs all throughout the Bible. But in Romans chapter 8, dubbed by some pastors as the greatest chapter, there are eight ifs, and, and I really believe Romans chapter 8 catches the power of if. Perhaps the most important what if statement that we even heard earlier this morning, it, it rests as the bedrock, the linchpin, really the cornerstone of the whole chapter, if not the whole book. It says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? As I've said over the previous weeks, and as I'll continue to say for the remainder of this series, the person who has placed his or her faith in Jesus, the, the answer to that rhetorical question is absolutely no one and absolutely no thing. If God is for us, who can be against us? Last week, we spent some time in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Discussing if only regrets. Listen, we, we all have regret. We all have regrets. Most of the time resulting from opportunities that we just left sitting on the table. And more specifically, we looked at regret in the context of sins of commission, sins of action, versus sins of omission, sins of inaction. And how there are usually, I would suggest, maybe one, two, perhaps maybe three regrets that just keep us uh, enslaved to our past, that leave us trapped in condemnation, therefore paralyzing us from living a life of faith that God has called us to live. We live instead in fear of being found out. Well, the most freeing verse in Romans chapter 8 and the first that allows us to really soar in faith that, that God has called us to soar in it is verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ 
Jesus. The therefore in that verse really tees up the sum total of all that Paul had talked about in chapters 1 through 7. And as we learned last week, the best way to put a restraining order on regret is to really repent. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God forgives us when we confess our sins, when we repent. Yet many of us still feel condemned by those past sins already confessed. And what, and what we have to understand that is that that condemnation isn't coming from God. That condemnation is coming from lies of the evil one. He is, he is referred to as the accuser of the, brother, of the brethren. That Satan attempts, when, when he attempts to remind us of our past, we emphatically remind him of his future. That he has no power over the child of God. That we are no longer enslaved to sin but rather to be debtors to the Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit. And it's this therefore in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that is the beginning of trading our if-only regrets for God's what-if possibilities. As we continue in Romans 8, we turn our attention to verses 5 through 18 this morning and use the, the therefore from verse 1 to really launch us into living as if what is said in the rest of this chapter is true. As if these things are real. It's a little bit of a lengthier passage. And so let me go ahead and just read this aloud over us today. Romans chapter 8, I'll read verses 5 through 18. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. It cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So then, Brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. May God bless the reading of his word. I would like to share just a few of my favorite as-if statements. Some of these statements, I, I know where they originate. Some of them I don't, so just bear with me. First one I want to share with you today comes from St. Augustine. He says this, or he is said to have said this, God loves each one of us as if there were only one of us. If you really fully grasp the weight of that statement, then, then that will set you free from all kinds of fear because as the scriptures say, perfect love casts out fear. God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. 
Albert Einstein once said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle. The other is as if everything is. And so for you, which is it? Everybody lives as if something to be true. But when you live as if everything is a miracle, then everything around you becomes a miracle all the time. These uh, two quick stories I just want to share with you over the last month that I've heard. Many of you know that I meet with a group of pastors from Downingtown and Westchester. And, and just last uh, month in April, one of the pastors who facilitates this group was going to the doctor's office because he had torn his Achilles tendon the month earlier. A couple of us pastors huddled around this pastor named Tim and, Tim, and we prayed for his Achilles tendon. Immediately, and I kid you not, immediately, the pain went away. When he went to the doctors that following week, he, the doctor said to him, your Achilles tendon is completely healed. Better than that, it's like that of a 16-year-old. And this guy is in his 40s. A miracle had happened. Another story that just happened this last week, there was a woman in our church who went to a conference with a few other women in the area. And for the last several weeks, she was experiencing just some incredible pain in her foot from plantar fasciitis. The pain was so bad that she said that she had to have her husband kind of put these contraptions on her feet just to help relieve some of the pain. Well, they're at this conference and, and one of the speakers had, had just prayed a general prayer of healing over all of the people who had attended that conference. Guess who was one of the recipients of that healing prayer? So this woman gets up after the conference and, and takes a few steps and all of a sudden she just bursts out in tears. The, the other women with the group are, are, are you okay? Is there anything wrong? Can we get you anything? And, and she goes on to explain that, that I, I have had so much pain in my foot the last couple of weeks that, that it's completely gone. It's not there anymore. A miracle had happened. There are two ways that you're going to live your life. As if nothing is a miracle or as if everything is. Which one will you choose? I don't know where this next statement originates, but it's, it was one that was etched in a, a piece of stone that used to sit on my kitchen counter. And it says this. Sometimes you can find it on a t-shirt. Sometimes you find it printed on a, on a shirt. But it says, dance as if no one is watching. Churn in the butter. <laughs> Do a little moonwalk. I mean, come on. That, that's a statement that continually reminds me just to enjoy life. Sometimes as Christians, we just need to put on the dancing shoes and cut loose. We're too uptight. Dance as if no one is watching. Here's one that I try to remind myself of often, stated by Augustine of Hippo. Pray as if everything is dependent on God. Work as if everything is dependent on you. Those are just the few as-if statements that I, that I find particularly empowering because, because every as-if is like an acorn that has the potential to blossom into a gigantic oak tree. And if, if, if those as-ifs, however, if they don't align correctly, if they don't line up with Scripture, then, then those little tiny acorns are going to burn up in a blaze of, of wildfire. But if those as-ifs do align with Scripture, well then, that little tiny mustard seed can move mountains. Matthew chapter 17. And so if, if verse 31 of Romans chapter 8 is the ultimate what-if statement, then I would suggest to you that Romans chapter 8 verses 10 through 11 is the ultimate as-if statement. That if we can live as if these verses are real and not imaginary, we might just see mountains move. Listen again to what Paul says in verses 10 through 11. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. 
You see, Jesus' crucifixion is the end of our if-only regrets, and his resurrection is the beginning of our what-if possibilities. What Paul says in verses 5 through 9, leading up to this ultimate as-if statement, is that the Christian life is, is really a constant battle between the sin nature and the spirit's nature. That if we set our mind on sin, Paul uses the term flesh in these verses, then we will live in that sin which ultimately leads to death. But if we set our minds on the spirit, then we will live in the spirit which ultimately leads to life. There was a doctor by the name of Wilder Penfield who was a pioneer in the field of neurosurgery. And he performed brain surgery over some estimated 1,100 patients. Many of his patients suffered from epileptic seizures. And and Dr. Penfield wanted to know why. So so what he started doing in his surgeries were were a little unorthodox. He He would, by the help of local anesthesia, he would remove the tops of the skulls of his patients, perform surgery while they were conscious, having a conversation with them, brain exposed and all. During one particular surgery, Dr. Penfield made a fascinating discovery. When he used very mild electrical currents, to stimulate different parts of the cerebral cortex, some of his patients experienced these flashbacks, these memories that had all but once been forgotten, vivid memories from the past. One patient recalled every note from a symphony that she had attended just a couple of years earlier. Another patient recalled sitting at a train stop and just remembering each specific detail of the train cars that passed in front of her. Another patient visualized a childhood comb and could number the teeth on that comb. So what Dr. Penfield concluded in this discovery is that every sight, every sound, every experience, every conscious thought and subconscious dream is recorded on our internal hard drive, known as the cerebral cortex. So here's how this complex process works. We'll try to simplify it just a little bit. When you hear a song, when you see a picture, when you read a verse of scripture, there is an engram, uh, an actual trace, an indentation on the surface of your cerebral cortex, which is called a memory trace. And so in these memory traces that that allow us to walk down memory lane, with each repetition, with each repeat, the memory trace gets inscribed deeper and deeper and deeper into your cerebral cortex. Now, let's consider this in light of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Paul says, have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. How do we have the mind of Christ? Well, we set our minds on the spirit. We set our minds on the word of God. When you pray along with, when you meditate, when you memorize the word of God, you are recreating neuronal connections and and rerouting old ones. Slowly but surely, your mind is being renewed. That's what the scriptures mean when you hear renew your mind. That is really what a mind sink is, that we're, we're sinking our mind with the mind of, of Christ, which is ours in Christ. And over time, those downloads and, and upgrades that form the mind of Christ in us is, is given to us as the Holy Spirit uses little electrical impulses to recall to mind promises from his word, to recall to mind truths from his scripture. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ, that we set our minds on the word of God. That's really how we tap into the potential of as if. That because we set our minds on the spirit, we live as sons and daughters of God. We set our minds on the spirit. Paul says in verse 14 of Romans chapter eight, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons, are daughters, our children of God. And so do you live as a child of God? Do you live as a son 
of God? Do you live as a daughter of God? The Holy Spirit in verse 15 is referred to as the, as the spirit of adoption. And to put yourself under the law is to move toward living in the flesh, really living in sin. It, it leads to bondage. It leads to condemnation. It leads to slavery. But the spirit leads to this glorious life of liberty in Christ. Now, to clarify, liberty to the believer never means freedom to do whatever we want. That only leads us down a path of greater bondage, of greater slavery. Rather, Christian liberty is in the spirit is freedom from the law and freedom from flesh so that we can please God to become the people that he has called us to become, to live into the potential that he has placed within each and every one of us. And this word adoption that's found here in Romans and also all throughout the New Testament doesn't really mean what we typically understand the word adoption to mean today. It doesn't mean that, that we're taking a, a minor or, or a child into a family and, and that person becomes a legal member of that family. It, become, it, it means so much more in the New Testament. It has this idea of son placing. The idea that no matter what stage of a Christian you are, a brand new Christian, or you've been a Christian for many years, that, that you have become a rightful adult heir. That everything that is at God's disposal, every spiritual blessing in heaven is at your now disposal. That Christian, that, that you as a believer and a child of God by birth and, and therefore a son of God, a daughter of God by adoption, you have access to every spiritual blessing in heaven. That God is your heavenly father. But the believer has to remind himself, herself, that we're no longer obligated to the sin nature. We're no longer obligated to the flesh, to live by the power of the flesh, to feed it, to pamper it, to obey it. Instead, we must put to death, we must mortify the things of the flesh, the sins that so easily beset us. So if we set our minds on the spirit, so too should we kill our sins in the spirit as sons and daughters of the most high God. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not talking about a, a self-confidence here. I'm not talking about relying on your own strength and ability. I, I'm really talking about a, a spirit's confidence, a confidence to, to really live in the reality that we are sons and daughters of God and co-heirs with Christ. Listen, my confidence in, in myself isn't very high. I once walked into a sliding glass door in a public place. <laughs> it was a pretty clean glass door, to my credit. I know who I am. I know who I'm not. I know that, that, that God is helping me labor, or, or, or and if I don't recognize that, that I'm just laboring in vain. I know that, that he who began a good work in me is, is going to bring it about to completion. I know that God takes the foolish things of the world and, and shames the wise, and he takes the weak things of the world to, to shame the strong. The core of my confidence isn't in whatever ability or gift that he's given me. No, the, the core of my confidence is in the, is in the never-changing, ever-faithful, all-loving, all-powerful God that we get to call Abba Father, Heavenly Father. The core of my confidence is, is in the living word of God that does not return void. The core of my confidence is in the promises of God that have already come true and then the promises of God that will come true that find their yes in Christ. Yes, the core of my confidence is in the spirit who raised Christ Jesus from the dead and who is now alive in you and me. It's not a self-confidence but rather a spirit's confidence. I'm talking about living in such a way of knowing who you are in Christ, knowing without a shadow of a doubt that you are a son, that you are a daughter of the most high God. And if we really lived as if that were real, that would completely alter everything that we do. Do you live as if that is real, 
as if that is true of you today. In closing, I want to tell you a story that I believe helps illustrate this point. During the 1990 NBA season, Chicago Bulls superstar Michael Jordan, he dropped 69 points, a career high on the Cleveland Cavaliers. One reporter asked Stacey King, one of Jordan's teammates, how, how uh, he was going to remember that game. Now, it was an interesting game. He, he saw much of that game from the bench. He was a role player, but he was also a, a role player with a sense of humor. When, when King thought about the question for a, a second, he, he responded, oh, I'll always remember that game as the game that Jordan and I combined for, for 70 points. You see, Stacey King had only scored one. Stacy King rode the coattails of Jordan to not just one NBA championship, not just two NBA championships, but to three NBA championships. Listen, child of God, you ride the coattails of God, the all-powerful God of the universe, the all-loving God of the universe. I think one of the reasons why we're so hesitant to live in such faith as if these things were true is because much of our faith relies far too much on circumstantial evidence. This is what I mean. If if you've ever watched a crime show or had the opportunity to sit in on a a criminal uh, trial as part of the jury, then you've learned that there's a difference between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is really that personal testimony that that carries a particular unique weight in the court of law. Circumstantial evidence, however, relies on inference, like a fingerprint at the scene of a crime or a ballistics report that had been given by some forensic expert. It's really the kind of the smoking gun, if you will. When it comes to living in faith, I, I believe that we allow our doubts or or we allow the doubts of our circumstances to dictate our conclusions. That we have to be able to to rationalize everything. That, That if something doesn't make sense to us, then we totally just dismiss it. If we can't come to some logical conclusion in our minds, then it makes us feel uncomfortable and we're just gonna let it go sit over here by itself. We have to be able to put everything, every event, every proposed miracle, every, uh, every instance in, in a nice little box with a pretty little bow on top when it comes to our theological positions or, or how we explain things away. I think true faith is resting on the direct evidences of Scripture, on the testimonies of the writers of scripture, of, of the testimonies of people in our community that share stories of, of healing, that, show, that share stories of faith, that true faith is relying on what God has done through what he has said through his word. It doesn't mean that you deny reality. It just means that you place your faith on a greater reality, a reality that's to come. That's, that's for, far more real than what you can touch, taste, feel, smell here. You know, Paul says at the end of, of this section, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Listen, Jesus was a realist. Jesus even said in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have problems. You will have tribulation. But he was also an eternal optimist. Because right after that, he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I think sometimes we miss out on the promises of God because we run from the problems. That we don't want to deal with them. But God says, if you just suffer for a little while, then there is a greater glory coming that has no comparison to what you are experiencing in the here and now. 
Jesus' crucifixion puts an end to our if-only regrets, and his resurrection begins our what-if possibilities. We just need to live as if it's true. So how are we doing with that? Look, I don't know what that means for you today, to live as if something to be true in your life, to, to live as if you know, the spirit of Christ who raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit who lives in you. That ought to change the course of your entire journey. But the ultimate what if, the, the ultimate as if statement in the Bible comes out of Romans chapter 10, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the greatest gift. That is the greatest promise that you could ever hold on to. And so I ask you, do you believe in that today? Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that he died for your sins and that he rose again from the grave? The Bible says that if you do, then, you are a child of God. You are heir of the king. And so now we have a life waiting for us to live in faith, to see what he might do, to be used by whatever purposes he lays before us, to, to live in the potential that he placed in each and every one of us. Let's just think about that for a moment. Father, would you call to our minds? Would you, even in the deepest recesses of our souls, would you help us to understand this, this life that you've called us to? Give us the faith. Give us the, the strength to hang on to the times when we don't know what exactly you're doing, but, but we cling to those verses that you couldn't work it all out together for good. Help us to rely on the direct evidences of scripture, the people that you've worked in time after time and, and you continue to work in today. Help us to live in the reality that we are co-heirs with your son, Jesus. And that if we even just realize just a little minuscule amount of what that means for us today, how different we would be. Help us no longer to be condemned in our past sins. Help us not to, to give ear to what the evil one is throwing at us, but rather to rest in the truth of who you say we are. And if you're here today, and, and if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, if you haven't placed your trust in him, that, that he died for your sins, and if you would like to do that today, it's a simple acknowledgement that yes, God, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that my sins are covered by his blood and, and that he died for those sins, but he's not still there on that cross that he rose again from the dead. Not that I can just hold on for eternity, for this glory that's to come, but that I would live in the life, this life more abundantly that you've called me to live here today. By that simple declaration, you are now a child of God.